<laughs> so what impeccable timing. I'm going to tell you things about Deborah that she already knows. Um, she has a very impressive resume. She's a prize-winning journalist specialized, of course, in science. She's won a Pulitzer Prize. She writes a column. She's the author of six books, including uh, two recent ones that look at poison and often poison, toxicity, and the overlap into the pharmaceutical industry. That was quick. I have to keep going. I couldn't say everything that fast. She's a former president of the National Association of Science Writers. She was a member of the governing war board of the World Federation of Science Writers and currently sleep serves. I said sleeps because I was wondering how you sleep. Sleep works. <laughs> she currently serves on the board of advisors of the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing. Um, She's been the director of the Knight Science Journalism Program at MIT since 2015. And if that all were not enough, she also is the publisher of the fascinating journal that the Knight Program publishes. It's digital. You can all visit it, and I strongly suggest you do. I did, and it's so impressive. It's called Undark, a very suggestive title that has its roots in science, but I won't elaborate. But the mission of UNDARC, and it's consistent with really the mission of, of the Knight Foundation, as I understand it, having sat in on a number of their programs, is to, this is a quote, illuminate the complicated and fractious places where science collides with politics, economics, and culture, and where differing worldviews compete for resources and influence. And if that sounds a bit familiar because it tracks a number of our recent conversations, it is. Um, they're not covering science at that digital platform as a kind of ha-ha phenomenon, the way a lot of popular science magazines and journals have done. It's not a curiosity cabinet, if you know that expression, but more and this is again their words, as a wondrous, sometimes contentious, and occasionally troubling byproduct of human culture. Undark, therefore, again a quote, aims to explore science in both light and shadow. We've been talking about light and darkness this week because we had Priyambada Natarajan with us, the astrophysicist, talking about dark holes and illumination and extrapolating from that to other forms of writing. And their aim also to bring this kind of writing and this exploration to a broad international audience. So I'd like to think that we are playing our own small part in empowering the next generation of writers who think along these lines and who will have increasing capability to take on science, even if not from a strictly scientific background. So with that, I would like to welcome Deborah Blum again and turn the screen over to Tyrone and Alicia. And I think Alicia will just say a word or two in Espanol again, so everybody knows that they're welcome and included. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Débora, eh, Tyrone, y, y bueno, a todo el equipo, a Magda y a todo el equipo de Under the Volcano, por esta oportunidad que tenemos para conversar eh, por algo que de pronto fue un periodismo que estaba muy lejano y a la vez muy cercano a nuestras vidas y de un momento a otro se convirtió en nuestras vidas. El periodismo que, que tiene una relación directa con la ciencia. Así que pues para mí es un honor solamente decir gracias y dar la bienvenida a mis colegas mexicanos y en lengua española a este conversatorio. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alicia. Um, and thank you, Deborah. It's great to, to see you face, well, sort of face to face. <laughs> and I'm so, it's such a privilege to have you with us um, and to be, for me to be able to, to talk to you. Um, you know, we're teaching a, a journalism course in a very strange time in the world and in journalism. And it's all a science story, but it's also an amazing human story. And what I love about your work is that you are able to sort of blend these two so seamlessly with the language that you choose, the characters that you use to bring the stories to life. Um, this week, you know, as we start our class, you know, we're talking a little bit about just getting, getting going, coming up with ideas, how to even uh, construct the narrative is sort of a later conversation. First, you've got to come up with, 
a way, uh, the tools for the narrative, the people, the sources, the information. I would love for you, if you could start out by talking to us a little bit about just how you structured this. I mean, it's, you know, the, the, all of the stories that the, that the folks in my group are coming up with are so rich and complex, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, we have to sit down and be storytellers. Could you talk to us a little bit about that challenge as you've experienced it with your work? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you know, it's almost a chicken or egg kind of question. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes once you figure out the structure of your story, that will tell you how who you need to interview and how you need to put the information together. And sometimes the information leads you to the structure of the story. I'm a big, I, I sit in a group of narrative writers, US narrative writers who obsess about that. And, and so I am a big believer in a couple of things. One is that uh, all the best stories have some planning ahead in terms of structure. You know, it's helpful to know before you write a story. And I used to teach creative nonfiction when I was um, in, in one of the quirks of my career. I was a pro actual professor at the University of Wisconsin and I am staff at MIT. I'm director of a program. So and the academic sense of step down. Right. But a more interesting job. But when I was a professor at Wisconsin, I taught narrative nonfiction and creative nonfiction and the history of narrative writing. And, and I would actually assign my students to do a story in which they had to tell me both the beginning and the end before they started so that they could build the narrative arc of the story. I have, and I don't know if you guys want me to show it here, a, a short uh, PowerPoint, mostly images, on what I call the geometry of storytelling. And I can put, I can share that screen if you'd like and kind of walk you through some of the standard structures of narrative as I use them and talk a little bit about stories that fit that pattern if you like. Yeah, please, that might be helpful to help visualize uh, the, the, the structures. That'd be great. I'm a fairly visual writer. So let me see if I can share this guy. Come on, baby. And then. Everyone sees this okay, right? Uh -huh. So yeah. I I think of this as geometry. I actually did a presentation once with a friend in which he did all his structures as symphonies, and I just could not make that work. So let me talk a little bit about it. And, and this is the American poet who I think of as the patron saint of narrative writing, uh, Emily Dickinson. And this is a, a poem uh, it's actually the, the title of a book on uh, creative writing, Tell All the Truth, But Tell It Slant. Success and circuit lies too bright for our infirm delight. The truth's superb surprise as lightning to the children eased with explanation kind. This is my favorite part. The truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. And the real message of, of that is, I think, sort of the patron, uh, the idea of narrative writing, which we don't hit you over the head with it. We don't lecture you. Our fingers are not in your face. What we want to do is tell you a story that's so seductive that you're just going to read the story and along the way you're going to learn uh, at least our version of the truth, right? Uh, so I come from a newspaper background. The uh, structure that I grew up with and everyone does in journalism school, I don't know why this says inverted triangle, it's making me nuts, uh, was the inverted pyramid. And to me, and it's a very standard news structure, but to me it works like this. You start out with the lead. The lead is the seduction, right? The lead is not to throw a bunch of facts in the face of the reader, the lead, the opening graph or the opening section, if you're writing a magazine story, is the opening that pulls the reader into the story. And if you can't get them past the lead, then you failed, right? So you start with the lead and then you do in some version, some people call this a nut graph. I think of it as the so what section, so what? You've told me this amazing story. I'm super interested, but why am I reading it and why am I here? I'm a busy woman, right? Give me the information that tells me why this matters. And then I then there's the setup, which is okay, you know, a compelling opening, great. Here's why I'm here. Where am I going? And and you know, on a smart journalist, a lot of times just use this section 
you, you might have four or five points that you know you're going to address in your story. You kind of uh, summarize those here in a way that gives a little bit of suspense to the story. Stick with me. I'm going to take you through all these things. Then you go through those story points and you, then you come to a conclusion. And that basically breaks apart what I think of as the way all news stories work. And, and the probably the best thing about knowing this is that if you have to and you are you know, trying to phone in a story from a desert and your computer doesn't work and you just have to compose the story in your head on your cell phone, you can use this. And I've done this actually. I actually had one time where my laptop totally let me down and I was covering an election and I just wrote the story in my head. So I highly recommend keeping some of these structures in your head anyway. Uh, by contrast, what I think of as the diamond structure is the basic structure of magazine writing. And a lot of people, you start small, usually this will be an anecdotal lead. You open up the story to what your issue is and you close back probably by closing out that anecdote. And one of the people who does this best is Atul Gawande at The New Yorker. And if you wanted to look at a great example of this, it's not COVID, but he did a story a few years back on the way that we overcompensate for illness and keep people alive way far longer than we should because we don't want to give up and drag through, through all kinds of torturous treatments. And so that story started with the story of a young woman um, in her early 20s who's pregnant and, and is then diagnosed with a really aggressive and dangerous cancer. And she doesn't want to give up, right? And he opened and he, she's willing to try any treatment that will allow her to survive this and be a parent. And he opens up with that, all the ethical fraught complications, and then opens it up into the bigger issue of how dangerous this is. And takes, and so by the by the time you get to this wide point, he's talked to doctors and nurses and other patients and has some history of this. And when he closes it, she dies. It's given her six months of really terrible life and she dies at the end of the story. And so that, I mean, it's a heartbreaking story, but it's also a classic use of what you think of as a diamond structure. Some people think of this as a circle narrative, right? Starts and begins kind of in the same place or on the same point. Um, well, I was talking about when you, you know, you kind of know where your story is going to start and end. And so narrative writers will, I'm going through this very fast, sorry, but narrative writers will really think about the perfect narrative arc. And what that really is, is, you know, I'm going to start at this point that pulls you into the story and there's going to be some kind of epiphany like moment that pulls everything together. That's going to lead me to the end. Um, it could be a rainbow even. But you could also look at it more like, you know, in detail like this, um, which is, you know, you start by opening up the issue, the action rises to a certain crisis, the crisis resolves and that leads you to your conclusion. And there's a wonderful book called um, Writing for a Story by John Franklin, who's one of the few American science writers who won two Pulitzer Prizes for narrative writing when he was at the Baltimore Sun, um, in which he talks about an unstructured story being like a plate of spaghetti with all your ideas, you know, going off in different noodles all over the plate. And his basic idea of a good narrative story fits this structure. He says, you know, you start with a conflict and the end of the story resolves that conflict. And so what you have to do is get to the point where the conflict hits its crisis and then you bring it down to the end. Um, and if I had time, I would walk you through one of his more famous stories, but if we, but if we have time, I'll come back to that. Um, another famous narrative structure is called a broken line narrative. I had a graduate student uh, years ago. <laughs> I had a graduate student who put together a lot of these images for me and she was obsessed by the fact that you could find narrative structures in nature. And that is why you see this, this peculiar sunset cloud formation here. But a, break, a broken line narrative, if I push it a little farther, 
is like this. I have a main story. My main story is a scientist on a quest to develop an mRNA vaccine. But I'm going to break the storyline. What is, you know, who's the scientist? Exposition. What's the issue? We're using a brand new technology to try to develop a, a vaccine at warp speed. What's the history of this idea? Who invented it? And so you're calculating breaking and, and you return back to your scientists on their mission, but you calculatedly break that. It's a broken line narrative. Um, and the trick with a broken line narrative, and one of my uh, favorite writer friends says this to me, is that you know a good story will pull the reader right through. It's like my, I've heard different analogies. Mine is like, you put the reader on a boat and the current of the river pulls them through the story. But there might be side trips. Well, how many side trips, how many breaks in your storyline is your reader willing to put up with before they go, that's just too complicated. I'm stuck in this boring issue. I, I'm giving up on the story. So a lot of that is you thinking before, and I'll come back to that, about how many breaks you're going to have and whether the story will pull them through this many issues. Uh, a couple other famous story structures uh, one is the zipper narrative. I use this one a lot, actually, and I see it in uh, a lot. And probably just to give you an example, one of my more successful narrative books, The Poisoner's Handbook, is a zipper narrative. It, it's a little more complicated than that, but but it's basically the story of two scientists in the 1920s trying to figure out how to catch poisoners, which no one knew how to do moves forward chronology through this crusade, but it's also the story of poisons and what they are and how they work. So what you do is you zip back and forth between the two stories. And the tricky thing for you as a writer is where does the, the zipper intersect, right? When do you pull your poison together with your you know, crusading scientists? And when is it just the scientists? And when is it just the poison? Actually, it's a lot of fun to figure this out. Another example of this is a braided narrative. And probably one of the more famous book examples of this is a book called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Uh, by Rebecca Skloot. And, uh, and she talked about this a lot. You know, the braided narrative follows three paths instead of two. She actually worked out the structure of her book by putting the three different storylines into three different colors of index cards. I can actually tell you because we're friends that they were pink, green, and yellow. And so the green storyline is the one that carries the story, really. It's Rebecca herself is a, is a character in The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lux, which, and she's a journalist on a mission to try to solve an injustice. And the injustice is the next storyline, which is the story of Henrietta Lux, who was a, a Black woman in the 1950s with an aggressive cancer, so aggressive and so that the cells were so indestructible or immortal that they actually spurred the development of cell culture science and became a multi-billion dollar industry. The catch there being that the doctors took those cells without telling her or family and didn't compensate them for them in any way. And so the next section of that story is the story of the Lax family. And the third section is an exploration of ethical issues in science. And so she braids those three stories together, the long history of morally questionable decisions by scientists in this field, the story of not only Henrietta, but her descendants, and the story of Rebecca on a mission. And so that's a braided narrative. You could have more, but this is a, also a very classic structure. You can do a straight chronology, right? And a lot of times straight chronologies will underlie almost any story we tell. There's another book, uh, Writing for S Follow the Story by James B. Stewart, in which he actually diagrams stories by chronology, by character, and by scene. These are New Yorker stories. So in the most um, detailed way, he walks you through every single scene in the story. Where does it fit on the chronology? Who's the character who is telling that part of it? Where is the, is the scene set? And finally, more nature photography. Um, 
this is a classic structure of uh, creative nonfiction. And then the guy who actually came up with this, at least in this format, is called Lee Gutkind. He's at the University of Pittsburgh and he is founder of the Journal of Creative Nonfiction. And so his point, which actually will work with any of the structures I told you, is you start with story, right? And the story is the seduction, as I said. And then you decide, you calculate whether you have pulled your reader well enough into the story that they're now gonna tolerate some actual numbers and information. And you calculate how much information are they gonna be able to stay with before, this is not so different from a broken line narrative in you know, some ways. And then you go back to story and then you go back to information and you layer your story up like you know a rock formation or a stack of pancakes. And I like food analogies. <laughs> and then if you're really any good at this, then the story is just one big S of story. And the information is woven so neatly into that story that people aren't even aware that you're trying to you know, give them information. And I use that a lot when I'm telling poison stories or poison murder stories, which I you know, have done quite a bit of. I'll use the story of the murder to carry forward the story of the chemistry itself, right? It's all calculating it out. Uh, like I said, my grad student absolutely loved these nature images, and I've actually taken a lot of them out. But this one, I, I just want to make the point that although, you know, I'll throw around terms like creative nonfiction, we're talking nonfiction, right? We don't make stuff up. You know, we might borrow in narrative writing from the techniques of fiction writer, character, suspense, rhythm, right? All of the things that an actual fiction writer might use, except <coughs> it's the power of the real. So when you're doing this, you really have to have the evidence in hand and it, and it has to be absolutely real. It, it, not only because, you know, you do want to actually have a believable story, but because reality has power. I'm not knocking fiction, but, but there's the power of the real. So you want to make sure that you're real right down to the very small details that are going to make your story come to life. Um, and that, and here's a few um, credits for those beautiful photographs, but that is effectively uh, my super fast rush through um, all of uh, the basic structures of narrative nonfiction. And I think they're really important. And I think they're important in part because um, everyone um, tells a story differently. I, I usually think of it as we hear the music of language differently. And you can't teach that. You cannot teach someone to hear the music of language the way you do. Sometimes you cannot teach someone to hear the music of language at all. But what you can teach are these kinds of tools. So in my experience as a science journalist, which as Magda points out, spans decades, um, sadly or positively, you could look at that either way. Um, but it, the hardworking science journalist with a toolbox, a good toolbox, is often more successful than the lazy, talented writer. And sometimes if you're able to use some of these tools really effectively, uh, you'll actually uh, look like the really talented writer. And, and that's actually one of the things that James Stewart says in his book. He, he basically starts it by saying, you know, I'm a terrible writer, but I'm able to camouflage that by all the ways that I plan and structure and plan my stories. And so that I am able to masquerade as someone who has real talent. I mean, it's kind of a nice way of looking at some of these structures. So I hope that, I know that was fast, but you know, I hope it was helpful too. Oh, that, that's great, thank you. And you know, it's interesting because I don't, I'm, I'm probably a terrible science writer, but I love writing about the human condition. So I, I do this sort of masquerade myself. <laughs> but there's something that you said, and I think it was a, an interview where, where one of your books, The Poison Squad, was being a, uh, adapted for, for video. But you said something like, I, I want to be able to pull people into the moment. I want to make these people come to life. Um, I wanted the power of the narrative to carry the issues forward in the book. Essentially, you want the book to have cinematic elements from 
from the beginning. Can you talk about that? Because that sounds great. But when you sit down with the material, with your reporting, as, as you know, the folks in my class and, and probably a lot of you will, will do, how do you start to do it in CinemaScope, right? I mean, it's different. How do you take the words and make them feel like they have this kind of scope, you know, with, with the finished process? Because the, the writing tends to come so much later, actually. Um, but how do you do that and personally? Yeah, that's a great question. And and everyone who writes knows that research is a lot more fun than writing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I've always thought what I should have become as a professional researcher because I like it so much. You know, so it, you're right that what I am aiming for when I do a book, I'm going to pick Poison Squad since we were just talking about it. Uh, is, is to write the book in the kind of cinematic way that I kind of referenced in, in, in my presentation, in which the story is so vivid and so you hope, you know, kind of pulls people into that moment that they uh, are just caught up with it, because issues are really hard to write about. Right. And, and and an issue story, the minute the minute you are looking at something that's kind of abstract or a big cultural or social issue and you're plotting your way through the sociology of it or whatever, you know, your readers are falling asleep right and left as you go. Um, when when I first started in journalism, we used to talk of the those kind of stories as four bowlers. Have you ever heard that? description where you know it's a dull but necessary story and you tell it in, in a dull way and mom dad son and daughter are all sitting at the morning table reading your story and eating their cereal and they all fall asleep in their bowls of cereal and it's a four bowler right knocked the entire family into a coma you don't want to do that so what you do want to do is stop and in your planning not just think of the structure but think how do I make this moment real? And how do I make this person real? So, and, you know, and, and I don't have the crutch. I mean, I, you know, I write books. Books sometimes do or sometimes don't have photographs. When I wrote Poisoner's Handbook, my editor said, I'm not putting a single photograph in this book because I want the readers to just see it in their head, right? Um, so, so in that case, and that's a wonderful challenge for a writer, it's like, how do I bring you into the 1920s? And, and what I'm going to tell you is that where that's where research is your best friend, because you need absolutely every detail that brings a given scene to life. And you know, at one case, just to give you an, a, a quick example from that from Poisoner's Handbook, um, I did two chapters on carbon monoxide, and one of them was about this really inept uh, murder conspiracy ring in which these guys in the early 1930s are all broke, it's post-depression, they're running an illegal speakeasy, there's this one patron, Mike Malloy, who keeps coming in and, you know, running a tab and drinking all the cheap whiskey and they all hate him. And they think, but what if he died? And what if we had an insurance policy on him? So they create the syndicate, they insure this Irish drifter, Mike Malloy, with a couple of companies, and they set out to kill him in a way that looks like an accident and they poison his alcohol and they put metal shavings in his sandwiches and they hire a cab driver to run over him and they put him on a park I and mean, it's an you couldn't make this stuff up right put him on a park bench in february and pour water on him in new york city and he survives all of it i mean they you know when the newspapers finally started writing about this they called him mike the durable right um, and so I want to, and eventually they use carbon monoxide in a very heavy handed way and eventually get caught and they all went to the electric chair because back in the 1930s in the United States, they didn't mess around with capital punishment, you went to the electric chair, but um, so I want to make this real. I want to be able to describe like the speakeasy and what these guys looked like, right? So I had me, I had to read, I had to uh, both use ProQuest historical newspapers and go to the New York City Municipal Archives and look at the local papers on microfiche. And then, quit. And then I uh, had found some photographs of the street where the speakeasy was. Literally, I had a, a, um, a magnifying glass. And I magnified the street to such an extent that I could read the movie posters. You actually find it in the book. 
right on the wall next to the speakeasy and I could see the dusty boxes piled up in the speakeasy that what you know which they used to try to disguise the fact that it was an illegal whiskey hangout um and so all of that goes into catching the moment right and I found myself in that book particularly looking for um you know uh, you know, what were the cars of the time and what was the air like and, you know, uh, how did people dress and who wore what kind of hat. So all of those details grow, go into creating this, you know, sort of vivid picture of the time. People are the hardest, right? I mean, I think all of us have read profiles in newspapers of people where you finished it, you thought, well, that was interesting, but that person didn't feel that real to me, right? Um, and so there you really do have to both interview people in a way that you get them to talk about themselves. Now, obviously, you can't do that with these kind of history books. Or you have to find in history, um, if I'm doing a history book, letters and telegrams and archival materials in which their personalities come to life. And I'll use that too. And eventually, these people like live as characters in my head. It's, I mean, I'll tell you, once you get deep enough into this, and I think this comes across in storytelling, if you spend enough time that this person becomes like, a, 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 lives in your house, that's how I always think of it, right? They're a character in your everyday life. You, you see them. I actually have conversations with people when I'm writing about them. You know, I'll be like, why'd you say that? That was a really stupid thing to say. And they're so real to me that I can pull that onto the page. But but you have to do all that work first. You can't just, ex and you have to look for all the, the kind of fine details. You can't just say so-and-so was drinking a beer. What beer? Out of a bottle? Out of a glass? Right? You really have to drill down to create those pictures. So I want, I want to ask you something to piggyback on that because you, uh, I love the way you take historical moments and make them feel as if they're happening in real time with detail. We're in a historical moment now with the, with, with the pandemic. It's not just a science story, but, the, but this thing that has been sort of introduced to us and has changed our world has led to all these human stories. How do you, can you advise us on how to get good narratives at a, in the time of Corona when you may not have the luxury actually of, of going to meet somebody in their home? If they're afraid to let you in because because of the virus or, or because I've been vaccinated, I've had this challenge myself. How to do intimate stories that feel big and small at the same time? Can yes. you talk about how you get at that right now? Because it's it's going to be a challenge for some of some, some of my writers in my group. But I think this is a, something we face as journalists, uh, uh, broadly speaking, right now. It is really hard, and I and I mean I don't know about you, but in the past year there have been a number of times where I've just thought I hate living in moments in history. <laughs> I want to live in a really boring time period that will never appear in a single textbook, right? Because they're so challenging, and so yeah, it's really hard to do those kind of do that kind of narrative journalism in a pandemic. But we see it all the time, right? And so. We, there was a really interesting uh, narrative story in Undark recently uh, about um, the lab leak theory of COVID-19 uh -huh. uh, that really looked at, did portraits of the scientists, legitimate scientists who had done research that suggested that that was a possibility and, and just been crushed by the uh, people who felt that that was a politically incorrect thing to do, right? So to do that and to pull that story off with all those ethically fraught complications, right? You have to make those people both real and, you know, as a writer, someone that people just don't go, oh, this is a crank, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's a, there's, I think there's a few ways you do it. Sometimes, you know, anyone who's a beat reporter just develops really good sources, right? So that, you know, it's easy for you to access people and, and, you know, have honest conversations with them. I, one of my best friends here in Boston is Helen Branswell at STAT, who just won the Polk Award for covering COVID-19. Um, and she was telling me about something that came up and she sent a text to Tony Fauci and he called her five minutes later to talk about it, right? 
And I thought that never happens to me, right? But that's someone who's been an infectious disease reporter for a long time and has built that kind of network. So I do a couple of things when I'm doing a narrative now. You know, I go to people I know who can help me find, you know, the doctors or the nurses or the patients, right? And then sometimes if I don't know them well, you know, I'll do a couple of conversations, but I'll also ask them about them. So you're stuck in your house. What's your house like, right? What does it look like? Where do you sit? I actually knew someone, and, and this was really helpful for me as a science journalist, who was a professional profiler of celebrities. And he did like a whole series of different, you know, profiles of celebrities. They were super fluffy. But a lot of times he wouldn't go out and interview them, but he would do the interview. And, and once they had gotten to that comfort level you recognize in a phone conversation, he would say, you know, okay, this is going to be a profile. And, and I want to make people really see you. You, I want to, and I want to make people really visualize you. So let's talk about, you know, just give, give me an idea. What kind of chair are you sitting in, right? What are you wearing? What's the color of your eyes? Are you drinking anything? Is it coffee? Do you drink coffee in the morning? Is there cream in it? And just kind of go into enough of those details that even though you can't be there, you can use them. I always think in these kinds of conversations. You know, a journalist, and, and it can be uh, deceptive and dangerous, as I, but journalists are paid professional listeners, right? We're not like psychotherapists, obviously, but in the moment that you are doing an interview with a journalist, you're the most interesting person in the room. That's really seductive for people who are being interviewed. It's one of the reasons I think, and I've certainly not used everything people have told me, that people will say things that you go, you shouldn't be saying that to a journalist, right? Because no one is as interested in them, right? So, and so, you know, once you get that, that's the interviewing skill, right? Where you put people at ease and you make them comfortable talking and they also are riding that feeling of the fact that they're the most interesting person in the room you open up the possibility to ask those questions. And, and I have used that a lot in my science writing career because scientists are wary of the press. I don't know why, but they're really, you know, cautious about talking to reporters and, and they'll start out very non-relaxed. So I'll think a lot. So my interviews are, are a little winding in the way I do them because I'm trying to get them to the point that I know we're going to have a comfortable conversation. And that's where you get, I think, even in a pandemic, the kind of details you need. Now you can do Zoom interviews and right, and those as well. And I know a lot of people who do those as well. And then you don't have to say, what are you wearing, right? right. But, but fact checking, I'll tell you the one thing I will always ask people, even if I'm um, in the room with them is, uh, the color of their eyes, because I always get that wrong. I absolutely never remember what color anyone's eyes are. So I always have to say, are your eyes blue? So that's that I know great. I don't screw it up. It's true. That's great. Well, something I wanted, this is so so rich. Thank you very much. Something I want to get to before I, I uh, open it up for, for, um, for questions and to and call on Alicia is the counter narrative. Um, you know, we have the pandemic and then we have what people believe about the pandemic. We have the vaccines and we have what people think about the vaccines. Um, polls show that maybe 30, 40% of Americans anyway may not get the vaccine because of myths about its efficacy or its side effects. I, I had this conversation with my own dad actually, you know, uh, to convince him to take it. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, as journalists, how we not just work with research and information, but how we work with myths and misinformation, sometimes um, pushed by uh, those in power. I mean, uh, how, do you, how do you do that uh, at a time like this? Can I just say, this is a political statement that I'm so glad that we are not in the past administration, speaking <laughs> of people in power who were pushing huge amounts of misinformation, right? I didn't want to say anything, but you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, let me, no, 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 go ahead and tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Trump. I'll probably hold a grudge about those four years for the rest of my life. Um, 
so you know the vaccine story illustrates a lot of the complications of, uh, of reporting in a pandemic and reporting today i think and i'll tell you that i was naive at first when this pandemic first boiled up the way it did i thought to myself it's so obvious that the only way we're going to get a grip on this is vaccination that finally the anti-vaxxers will say okay we can see a good reason for this vaccine they didn't right and and part of the challenge for us in journalists and, and part of the problems with it is that you know the internet allows us to be so uh, siloed in our sources of information and you know people will talk about the anti-vax groups on facebook and their reach i actually saw a story recently saying that the majority of the anti-vaccine misinformation is generated by about a dozen people with an enormous amount of reach and um, influence and sharing and i don't know as journalists how we can counter all in fact i don't think we can i don't think that we can counter that and that's one of the reasons we see vaccine hesitancy and that's one of the reasons I worry that we won't hit herd immunity. Uh -huh. And that's one of the reasons that I worry, and I certainly have seen this in some of the coverage of, not just in the United States where we're seeing these pockets of, um, uh, you know, hot spots of uh, the, new the new variants popping up, but in countries like India and Brazil, where they have huge outbreaks at the moment, which are also scenarios for uh, evolution of the virus. And I'm starting to see um, in my, you know, sci geeky science Twitter groups, um, uh, different vi viral geneticists saying, we don't like the way this evolution is going. And there may, this may also be, this gets me off vaccines for a minute, but I'm gonna come back to them. You know, it looks like at the rate this is happening, this may be actually as unstable in some ways as influenza, which would be really bad news for all of us, right? Because, you know, you have to get an influenza uh, shot every year. It's about 30 to 50% effective be because the vaccine is, um, the virus is so unstable and unpredictable that they're always guessing at how best to counter it. Right now, we have a series of really effective vaccines. We have the two MNR va RNA vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, and we have the uh, a collection of adenovirus-based vaccines, the Russian Sputnik, which apparently is not nearly as effective as they pretend, but that's a different issue. Um, and then, of course, J&J &J and AstraZeneca which um, are, are both being challenged because of, you know, very rare blood clotting issues, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. The J&J &J AstraZeneca thing, I think, is going to feed anti-vax narratives in a big time way. And if they do unpause it and put it back on the market, I think people are going to be afraid of it, right? Uh -huh. Even though the pause is to make sure, you know, we're absolutely going to make sure this is completely safe. That's not the story that's being told in the anti-vax network. The other things that are being told in the anti-vax networks are um, that the mRNA vaccines are actually an evil plot by the government to alter your genes and, uh -huh. you know, take control of you, or that Bill Gates uh, is uh, part of a program to make sure that microchips are included in the vaccine. I can't even say that one with a straight face, but people- I've heard that one. I, I mean, I've, I've heard that uh, in with people who are otherwise fairly serious. Um, yeah. yeah. So you have all of these, and some of them are so based in, in myth and pseudoscience and weird conspiracy theories that as science journalists, you know, you can't say, well, science doesn't say that Bill Gates is in, I mean, you know, you, it's just like this impossible, it's not a science story at that point, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's a story of politics and conspiracies. And so a lot of what we're starting to look at is how to best build, um, you know, how to best counter conspiracies, mm -hmm. how to best get good information to people who are hearing these things, how to how to be a trustworthy source. I actually, I just wrote a piece, they haven't actually told me they love it, but they just wrote a piece on um, 
I just wrote a piece for science, the journal Science, uh, on their editorial section on the history of science journalism. And, and basically what I said is, you know, the best thing we can do as journalists, and I don't think this is limited to science journalists, is to get the story right and to keep telling it. And those are really the best tools that we have, right? To, to be absolutely sure that we've nailed the basics and the science and, and you know, and acknowledged when there's uncertainty, right? Met, tried to make, uh, to do clear exposition of how this works, right? You know, for instance, M M M M I'm having a hard time saying that today, mRNA vaccines, are new, but the but the science of RNA, messenger RNA is old, 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 right? There's a long history of that. We didn't suddenly pull that out of a sock in the sock drawer yesterday, right? Uh -huh. And so to make people understand how science works, which I don't think we've always done well, which again can be a story of people or, um, you know, a, a, mission, a science on a quest to solve or all of those things. But to tell the stories in that Emily Dickinson way, in a way that's just not saying, you know, I think you're stupid and I'm smarter than you. And, and I think that's one of the real powers of narrative, right? Is that we do tell it slant or sideways, that we tell the story in a way that doesn't seem like a lecture, that we try to make it such a readable story that people just absorb the information. But the other thing we do, and, and and that we have to do is tell it over and over and over and over until we also, against the body of millions of conspiracies, we have the greater body of really good work saying something else, right? Yeah. Um, and there's a, hang on, I know this is gonna look kind of, do I have my, where's my, I'm looking for, a, here it is. Speaking of history of science, this uh, there was a great New Yorker writer called Berton Ruscha, who uh, wrote stories of medical detection back in the early 20th century, and he has this quote from a um, not, uh, uh, 18th century French doctor: "Do not fear to repeat what has already been said." Of course, this is the 18th century, so it's men, right? Men need the truth dinned into their ears many times and from all sides. The first rumor makes them prick up their ears, the second registers, and the third enters. And I love that quote. I actually, one of the reasons I've carried this book around with me for years, because the science writing's really good, but I, but I use that sometimes just to remind myself not to give up, right? Just because it's hard, just because it's daunting, just because it's frustrating, all of those are never reasons to give up, right? Stand up, do good journalism, keep telling the story, and eventually, right, we'll get there. Wow, uh, thank you. I, I will take that to heart. I've had so many arguments with my editor about why am I writing about black voters? I write a lot about race relations in the United States and get so exasperated with trying to explain to readers why these stories matter. And so thank you, you've actually given me a lot of fuel for my oh, own work, <laughs> Deborah, yeah. thank you so yeah. much. But I'd like to actually ask Alicia, if you're there, if um, if you have any questions for, for Deborah, and I wanna open it up to the, to the group as well, but uh, Alicia, if you're there. I think you're muted. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, H hello. Well, <laughs> I do yes, I have too. questions, but I, I prefer to give these minutes to our colleagues, to the public. I think that that's the most important now, if you agree. I'm Absolutely. happy to answer any questions. And I want you to keep doing more stories about Black voters, Tyra. That's a really <laughs> important subject. Thank you. Thank you. I'll like, do, my, do my best. But um, so I think we, we might we might have some questions if um, if this is I'm trying to find um so the 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 only question that I've seen so far this is Magda speaking is from Mauricio asking along similar lines to what you've addressed how to keep information from overwhelming a story how do you do it so that it doesn't feel even if you need a lot of exposition that it doesn't feel too heavy 
Yeah, I mean, I, that's such a perpetual challenge in science writing, right? Uh, you know, I have to explain, especially I find in stories that are number rich, right? Uh -huh. So again, I, oh, uh, you know, there's no one size fits all on this, but a lot of times when I'm working my way through a complicated piece of science, I'll again think of uh either the numbers or the chemical compounds as characters and i'll use that to try to pull, you know to to try to enliven the story obviously if there's pages and pages of numbers you know that's a different story but let me give you um a couple of quick examples of that um, at, at the Night Science Journalism Program, actually, we've signed a contract with Oxford University Press to do a guide to science journalism. And uh, one of the reporters for 538 did the chapter on statistics. And I was expecting her to do the usual, you know, statistics are hard, here's what p-hacking is, where I, which usually makes me, I mean, I've been a science writer a long time, but I've gotten to the point when, when people start talking about you know, p-hacking, I'm just like, oh, I have to go lie down. Um, so, but she didn't. What she did do is say, you have to see numbers, you have to look at numbers and almost interrogate the numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Think of them as characters in your story. And the example she gave was actually a COVID example, which is that all of, going back to the vaccine point, Taylor, every single one of these vaccines says that they are 100 percent effective at preventing at preventing covid 19 deaths but in fact uh, if you go down into the data you actually look at the numbers and the stories they're telling what you find is that only the j and j vaccine actually did that right if you look at the control groups for moderna and pfizer there were no deaths in the vaccinated group, but there were actually no deaths in the control group. So when you actually think of those numbers and kind of interrogate the numbers for the story they're telling, you realize that that's a misleading statement. And and all they, J and J, they did have deaths in their control group and none in the vaccinated group. It was a really small group. So it's always important when you're getting into these dense areas to take them sort of piece by piece and, and pull them apart and say, you know, I need to get these numbers say in the story, but what does, what story do the numbers actually tell me, right? Mm -hmm. And and once you've done that, you, you say, I'm going to do these numbers. Here's the story they tell. Then you can actually go back and look at your structure and say, and it's at this point in my story that I'm going to talk about this. Um, and, and, I, and one of the ways that I often do that is that, and then Anne Finkbeiner, who used to be head of the science writing program at Johns Hopkins, used to talk about the internal structure of a story as, as an A, B, B, C structure, I don't, right? Where you start with point A and this section or this paragraph ends on point B. And then your next um, section picks up on B and takes you to C. And your next section, I see this in the New Yorker all the time, this A, B, B, C construction, right? So the whole story moves forward and you can look at it. Your, your lead might be so-and-so is addicted to peanut butter. I can't stay away from peanut butter, he says. That's the end quote. The next section starts, what are the properties of peanut butter that make it so addictive, right? Uh -huh. but, but you really structure the story along those lines. And I will tell you that when I'm writing about chemical compounds, mostly poisons, but others, right, that are environmentally, interesting. I always think of them as characters. And I'll tell you why, because most chemical compounds are not dangerous, right? I'm inhaling vats of them even as we speak or when I'm drinking another bunch of chemical compounds here and you don't see me keeling over on the Zoom meeting, right? They're not doing any harm. Most don't. So the ones that do are really devious and clever, really devious and clever. And so, for instance, um, radium, if you've heard the, you know, the radium girls, which is the source of the, actually goes back to the name of the magazine I found at Undark. Um, but radium, the body thinks it's calcium. It's structurally just like calcium. So when those, 
immigrant watch dial painters in the 1920s were making luminous watch dials with radium based paint. They were lip pointing the brushes to make sure the brushes were sharp for the one and the two and the three on the dials and they were swallowing the radium. And, and, ra and when they swallowed the radium, the body literally says, oh, calcium. And so this radioactive element went right to their bones. Literally, their legs broke under them and their jaws crumbled and they developed, you know, aplastic anemias and leukemias. Um, oh. And so, and to me, that's fascinating, right? But it also is a way for me to think of like what a devious, both what a devious um, chemical radium is and also the way our bodies really let us down. <laughs> Right. Mm. And so, so, so when you actually get down to the point that you see the element or you see the number, there's always a story there. And then the trick for you is to find the story in the number, strive, find the story in the chemical compound, and then say, how can I use that in my story? Mm. And in my, you know, zipper narrative or my narrative arc or my ABC construction, where does it go? Uh -huh. And once you do all that work in advance, then in fact, those stories come into place. Yeah. Thank that you. That is so I, I, fascinating. Do we have yeah. time for one more question, Deborah? Sure. If, if you guys want to stay for one more question. I'm happy. I think, uh, it, and, and Magda, fantastic. actually, there's, there's something from someone in my, in my class, Epti, who, was ta who wanted yes. to go back to the idea of covering controversial topics. I mean, what, what, one of your other great books uh, for which you won the who uh, the inspiration uh, of it was a series for in the Sacramento Bee on uh, uh, the monkey wars and great, great book from the 1990s. But you're dealing with a lot of controversial information, certainly research on primates and and yeah. the debate therein, right? And animal rights activists. But let's bring it into the, the current moment where, you know, to what extent do you give voice to say anti-vaxxer groups or conspiracy theorists, you know, as you do this reporting, it goes back to the, converse, the conversation we had earlier, being, while being careful not to give them a mainstream platform, thereby spreading the myth. You know, I mean, how do you, how do you deal with that? And how do you deal with editors who might want you to kind of you know, venture into that territory, you know, just to give voice to quote unquote the other side uh, or opposing views, you know, because I think a lot of the people who are, um, who, the work that's gonna come out of my class, they have to have put things in the balance and figure out who not to include, um, right. what ideas not to include and, uh, and amplify. You know, th th I'm so glad you brought up that question because that's one of the really hot topics um, in science writing today is the question of what I'm gonna call false balance. Mm -hmm. And so it, 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 for science writers, I love controversy, by the way, right? And, 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 it's, and, and I like being able to listen to different sides of an issue and figure out what makes sense. But there, it, which was certainly true for me in primate, when I was writing about primate research, but, but, but to use a, an exa a destructive example of false balance and, and one that I think the, certainly the science writing community has, accepted as a failing on our part, uh, that would be climate change. Um, and if you go back to the way we covered climate change in the 19, probably starting in the 1990s, there was, we followed the political model, the, you know, there's always two sides. There's the Republican side and the Democratic side in the United States. There's always two sides to the story. That's the political model of reporting. And people applied that to the profession of science writing. So you would have a scientist say this about you know the approach of climate change and then your editor would require you to go out and find you know the other side and and that turned out to be a really destructive way to cover climate change because it made people think that there wasn't weight in one side of the story and there wasn't a scientific consensus you know there's a great book by naomi oreskes called merchants of doubt about the scientists who uh, basically, this is not an admirable group of scientists, but they're basically for sale to big corporations to inject doubt into a scientific controversy and started with uh, cigarettes, right? Uh -huh. You know, surely you don't believe that cigarette smoking is really bad for you. And these actually some of these same scientists became involved in the climate change um, narrative as well. So, 
one of the things that we have learned in science writing is that well, here's what a good reporter does. This is my opinion. You go out and you do your homework and you figure out where the weight of the evidence lies. What's the scientific consensus? And you report this, you, you become confident enough in where the weight of the evidence lies with the science of the moment, because it can change, but that you report it from that consensus. And hmm. so if you have to quote, and, and the scientists who were used as the counter argument for on climate change were all paid by the, paid by the oil and gas industry. Then you have to say, then you, you yeah, do a nod to, yes, but, you know, you know, scientists who work with the oil and gas industry put, put forward this counter narrative or, and you really qualify where that sits in the main argument. And so now, if you look at the way we report about climate change, we just report about it as it is. Climate change is real. Here's what's going on. Can we tie hurricanes to it? Can we tie drought to it? Can we tie our wildfire to it? But we sit on the weight of the consensus. And with vaccines, the same. Vaccines are one of the great public health discoveries of the 20th century. You know, I'm old enough that I have a smallpox vaccine, but no one gets vaccinated for smallpox anymore because we eradicated it as a threat in the American population, right? Or actually globally. So we know they work and we know they save countless lives and we know that there's a mythology about them that needs to be countered. And we also know and, and this is one of the big challenges of being a science writer in the digital age, that some of the people who work on the counter side can be really dangerous and threatening, right? I have a, a good friend who's actually, he's a physician at Michigan State and he, um, but he writes like on vaccines and things for the New Yorker. And he uh, went off Twitter because he was uh, getting so many death threats and people were sending him images of guns being held to his head and you know um so you also have to be aware of that when you do this but the fact of the matter is you know false balance misleads the readers and our loyalty i'm going to say readers because you know i'm a word person but readers viewers listeners our loyalty is to that audience it's not to the scientists they're not always right and, 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 and it's not to the industry. Our loyalty is to tell the best story for our readers. So to do that, we do our homework, we find where the consensus and the weight of the evidence lies, and, and we report the story. And I actually, when I was writing Poison Pen, which was my toxicology column for the New York Times, I did a, a piece once on phthalates, um, which are in, um, a component in a lot of plastics and which are uh, thought to be a big contributor to the reduction of male fertility around the world, right? They're banned in Europe in a way they aren't banned in the ever commercial United States. Um, and uh, I just put in a line saying, you know, you know, industry, um, industry takes a different position on this. And my editor at the Times, he said, don't you want to go interview an industry scientist? I said, no, right? It's all going to be bullshit. This is actually where the evidence sits. I've done all the reading. I've looked at all the journals. I've interviewed all these people. And I want to acknowledge that they don't agree with it. But I'm not going to give them a platform. And he said, OK. Thank you so much. I, lo I love the idea of, of not giving certain parties a platform when our when our reporting indicates that it's not due. And that's a huge conversation that happens in journalism every single day. You're so right. But thank thank you, Deborah, for bringing your insight and your passion for science journalism, but really for storytelling, which is what comes through to me mm -hmm. and for bringing for bringing issues to, to life. And uh, it's, it's a privilege to be able to talk to you. And I'm sure everyone will agree uh, uh, you, you, uh, your information has been so invaluable and just your stories have been great. So I really appreciate it. Uh, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much. Let's give Deborah a round of applause. That was really absolutely sublime. Nice. And thank you so much for coming uh, out or through the screen to us today after everything else you've been, you've been involved with. Um, it, you can tell I, I love talking about this, and those were great questions, Tyrone. It was really fun, and 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 I'm easy to find. So 
you know, if something comes up and, and you want to contact me, you know. We uh, do, because people are already asking if you might be willing to share your PowerPoint with us. Oh, sure. I'd be happy to do that. That's fantastic. So is my, I, I would do, for anyone on online that would, what, what you did with the PowerPoint, the geometry of storytelling is absolutely invaluable. I use those techniques in my own writing and they've helped me so much. So thank you for sharing those. It's really for anyone who wants to get a copy, I would certainly um, uh, encourage you to ask and, and maybe we can make that possible, uh, Deborah, to, for, to share with the whole group. I'll be happy to send that PowerPoint to, if you want me to send it to you, Magda, or, sure. do you, or both right, you right along and I'll forward it to Alicia and Tyrone and we'll thank you. disseminate. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. And, you know, feel free to use it if it's useful to you too, right? So, and we're, oh yeah, and we'll all be flocking to Undark. Um, yes. such, such an amazing talk, really. So, everybody, clap. Thank you again. It was a pleasure, seriously. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you.